My name is uh, Chaplain Cole Napper, and on behalf of MOCA and NOAA and the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, I welcome you to tonight's town hall. I'm thrilled that MOCA has asked me to be here tonight to help facilitate this conversation because I'm also a former commissioned officer in the United States Army who served in four tours of duty in the Middle East in support of America's war on terror. So I know truly what it means to back the blue. And it is, it is with that spirit that we start our conversation tonight around community policing and building good faith relationships between average citizens, the business community, and law enforcement. So tonight we're gonna to leave politics at the door there will be all sorts of people who will tell you that you have to be red or blue or black or white or conservative or progressive. I stand before you today asking you to choose unity. Let's agree that Athens, Georgia is an amazing place that we love and that we know can be a better place. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our amazing panel tonight. First of all, we're going to start with uh, our executive director of AADM, Mocha Jasmine Johnson. Mocha is a passionate educator, activist, mother, motivational speaker, and entrepreneur. Mocha's awesome. We love her. <laughs> Next. Uh, we, have, we are honored to have athens Clark County Deputy Chief of Police Harrison Daniel. Uh, Deputy Chief Harrison Daniel has served Athens community for 17 years as a police officer with the athens Clark County Police Department. During his tenure, Chief Daniel has worked in varying capacities across the department. His recent assignments include serving as the division captain in standards, records, and the training division, as well as being the commander of the Office of Professional Standards uh, and working within the criminal, leading the criminal investigations division, uh, personal crime section. Deputy Chief Daniel is a double graduate of the University of Georgia with a BA in criminal justice and a Master of Public Administration from the Department of Public Administration. He is a recipient of the Governor's Office of Public Safety Award for Acts of Heroism and the American Red Cross Law Enforcement Hero Award. Had to get all that in. That's good stuff. <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> Chaplain Shane Sims. Uh, Chaplain Shane Sims is the Executive Director of People Living in Recovery. That is a local nonprofit which assists families and individuals who are facing substance abuse, mental health, and homeless challenges. He is also the co-owner and director of Modern Pathways to Re Recovery, an in-house treatment program for men seeking long-term recovery. Chaplain Sims is a chaplain with the athens Clark County Police Department, and he serves as chairman of the nonprofit Feed My Sheep and sits on the boards of several organizations. Uh, we love Chaplain Sims. Uh, our next panelist is uh, a stranger to absolutely no one in this room. Uh, Tim Denson, athens Clark County Commissioner. Uh, Tim is currently employed at the United Campus Workers of Georgia as a labor organizer. Uh, he has worked as a community organizer in Athens since 2011. He has served on the athens Clark County Vision Committee uh, as well as Tim graduated from Edison College, and he has received multiple trainings on organizing, communications, and community engagement. His initial term uh, of service for the athens Clark County District 5 Commissioner seat uh, was in January of 2019. We're very happy to have you here, sir. Uh, and last but not least, Mr. Lee Reed. Mr. Reed is the Executive Director of the Atlanta Citizen Review Board a board designed to provide citizen oversight of misconduct accusations against sworn members of the police corrections, police and corrections departments in the city of Atlanta. Prior to joining the ACRB, Mr. Reed held the position of assistant director of the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights for six years with primary responsibility for the Minneapolis Citizen Civilian Police Review Authority. He is a graduate of Morehouse College and North Carolina University School of Law and School of Business. 
I read that right. He went to law school and he went to business school. <laughs> yeah. Overachiever. All right. Uh, prior to college, Lee served in the United States Navy aboard the USS John F. Kennedy. So he is a veteran as well, a true superhero. So um, we are very excited to have this awesome panel. And we have, uh, we're going to go ahead and start off tonight with Mocha. Uh, Mocha, if you could let us know, give us an overview of the Civilian Oversight Review and what it's all about, mm -hmm. and I'll take, let you take it over from here. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, also thank you to our awesome panel. We made sure it's diverse. We have representation from the police department. We have representation from the local government. We have someone with years, over 12 years of experience dealing with these type of oversight boards. We have Shane and I that were um, co-chairs of the Police Advisory Task Force and both him and I are engaged in the community through our nonprofit organizations and all the different work that we do. So after spending a year um, on this task team, we got to learn a lot about civilian oversights throughout this country. So um, <clears throat> a civilian oversight, also known as a civilian review, typically it is an office or it's referred to as an agency or it's made up of a review board. So a, civil, a civilian oversight, also known as civilian review, allow citizens or community participation in reviewing complaints regarding police misconduct. Members of a civilian oversight or civilian review boards are tasked with direct involvement in, this, in the citizen complaints process and recommend solutions to improve government accountability. The purpose of this agency is not to simply criticize the police but to help improve relationships between the community and police officers through accountability and transparency. The benefits that they have been able to document um, from having such an oversight, <clears throat> and I'm only going to name seven because there's a lot of other benefits as well. Um, complaints are given in place to voice concerns outside of the law enforcement agency. Whether people know it or not, our organization receives a lot of complaints from local citizens. Whether or not they believe that they can't go the regular route of filing it with the police department or they don't feel comfortable filing with the local government. We get a lot of complaints. So we're seeing a different side of it. We're seeing people's stories and voice not being heard. We're seeing people complaining about the fact that they filed a complaint with the police department and not getting back, whether it's um, someone getting back to them in a due time or they don't even understand the process. So people are filing these complaints. It's not some imaginary thing that we have made up. So this oversight will create a, create a space to where people can voice their concerns outside of the law enforcement agency. The oversight agency can help improve community relations by fostering communication between the community and police agencies. An oversight agency can help reduce public concern about the, pro about the high profile incidents. An oversight agency can help increase the police, the public's, let me repeat that. An oversight agency can help increase the public's understanding of law enforcement policies and procedures. An oversight can help hold the police or sheriff department accountable for an officer's action. The community at large can be reassured that discipline is being imposed when appropriate while also increasing the transparency of the disciplinary process. When the oversight agency confirms a complaint allegation, people in the community tend to feel that it's valid. So whether or not the outcome is, we didn't see any wrongdoing in this process and procedure, whether you believe that this incident was a bad way of the officers handling it, after the review board looks at it and they come out and say, we didn't see any wrongdoing, the community should be able to trust that board in, in the same way as the police department should be able to trust the board or that office to do the right thing and not be compromised or swayed to the left or to the right. So that is what a civilian oversight is. It is throughout the nation. It is not, it is nothing new. 
They have established from Atlanta to Denver and throughout the country. So that is what it is. Beautiful. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I know that one of the things that we had talked about was the task force recommendation, that whole process that you all went through a couple of years ago. Um, and I know that it lasted over a year. You all met monthly. And the task force came up with recommendations. Can you explain that process to people? I think that that is something that, you know, people, we've been tossing around terms, but I mean, people really need to understand the work that you all did. So, Chaplain Sims, can you explain? I think one of the first things that, that everyone should know is that the work that we did wasn't just a shot from the hip. It wasn't just a bunch of emotionalism. It was guided by principles and it was guided with the assistance of NACO um, who is a national authority on police advisory task force. And of the seven principles that we used to guide our work, the most important to me was what are the benefits for the community? Because ultimately that one principle encompassed all of the other six. What are the benefits for the community? And in order to see how we could benefit the community, we had to see what was wrong with the community, what needed to be fixed with the community. And we didn't come into this work as Democrats or Republicans, as conservatives or as progressive. We came into this work as citizens and people, fellow community members, people that love this city and wanted to see the city get better. And I don't think anyone in this room can deny the fact that relationships between the community and the police department is something that can stand work on, whether from the side of the police department or the community, that doesn't matter. What matters is that their work, there is work that needs to be done. And we begun this process with that in mind and trying to understand what are the things that could be put in place. Um, when we looked at the Police Advisory Council, we didn't simply look at Athens and say, okay, this is what Athens needs. We took the benefit of all of the work that's been done across this country. We looked at Athens in terms of its demographics, um, its size, its makeup, population, crime rate. And we were guided by NACO in looking at other demographics, um, other areas that had similar demographics. And we looked at what was implemented there and tried to the best of our ability to see what was the pros and cons of those advisory councils. And we came down with the one that seemed to provide the most benefits to this community, given our demographics, given our makeup, and given the issues and things that we face within this community. So it's important for the community to understand that this work wasn't guided by any ideology. It wasn't done by an individual that had no expertise. We had the expertise of NACO, and this was a product of us having a whole year of going at this, of reaching out, of consulting with one another. And this is what we came up to be the best advisory council component for Athens Clark County. And the um, advice, we, in addition to that, we we did community surveys during COVID-19. We did wrestle with, are we going to go and knock on doors? We did multiple surveys extended over 30, um, over 30 days. We did maybe two rounds, maybe even three rounds of surveys. We did town halls. But the most important thing that I want you all to understand, that this is not just one-sided. It has to be a working thing to where the community voice is involved and so is the police officers. And it has to be a thing where we all figure out how to work together for the best interests of athens Cross County. Some people don't understand that um, there are people that feel like they're, they're not being treated fairly and equally. So there is trust and it's broken trust. And if you can see what's happening in the nation, it's not necessarily getting better. I fight for Athens because I believe in Athens. I feel like Athens can be a model of like this great city. So that's why we do this work. And part of this is as a preventive measure to get ahead. So we can say we're already doing the work. We're already working towards building relationships and making our community stronger. So as Shane stated, we didn't just, um, we had NACO that was um, a national organization that's worked with different entities throughout the country to guide our work. We had a diverse group of people. Um, I, I enjoyed the makeup, even though it was difficult. The reason why I enjoyed the makeup of the board is because it truly was different voices and not all those voices got get along. And we have to learn how to have our differences and might not see eye to eye, but find that mutual pace to where we can build and grow. He had um, a high schooler. He had people with previous records. He had people on there from um, various organizations, different backgrounds. So even chief 
Um, Spruill was on there. Blaine, the city manager, attended those meetings. There was multiple voices at the table. And, and even though it was a <clears throat> difficult process for him and I, I love the diversity and I love the fact that we had opposing voices and different perspectives because we wanted to get the best model. It is a hybrid model. It consists of what, what they call, when we refer to the auditor, we're not talking about the auditor of athens Clark County. This is a separate type of auditor. They call it the auditor monitor. If it confuses people, forget about the title of auditor. Just call it the monitor, okay? So the monitor is the person that works every day, Monday through Friday, okay? The review board is made up of citizens from athens Clark County. They're not just randomly picked. There's a process to where other organizations can say, re recommend someone from that organization. The government is involved in the picking of this um, review board body. So it's a hybrid model. We wanted, there, we wanted someone to be able to work regularly on these situations. And we also wanted the community to have a seat at the table so that we can all come together to resolve some of our issues and to build trust. And um, just as a segue, um, one caveat that's important for everyone to understand is that when we ask NACO, um, how often does the decision of the advisory board conflict with the decision or determination of the police department? And she said that upward of 80% of the time, the advisory board comes to the same conclusion as the police department. So now the question may be, if the advisory board comes to take the investigative conclusions of the police department, then what is the benefit of the advisory board? And that's one of the things that we realize is that many of our problems are perceptive. You know, and I, as an example, I would say, you know, as parents, you know, you, you may tell your child, hey, go to school, avoid that crowd. And we may preach that to that child, you know, being authoritative figures. But that child may not hear it. But that child may meet a friend somewhere. And the friend may say, well, man, we don't need to go around those guys. And before you know it, the light comes on. The child says, well, yeah, maybe we don't need to go around them. It's about relationship. A lot of times, the police department may come to a conclusion. Um, that is absolutely correct. But because of the free relationship, the community is skeptical in accepting that result. And before you know it, all the theories, ideas, they, they, they blow up. If you have an advisory panel that walks side by side with the police department, they don't use up their power. They don't take over the investigation. They simply walk side by side, and when the conclusion is reached, that advisory panel say, yes, this was a full and fair investigation, and the result of the investigation was this. And it's more acceptable to the community to come from community members, so at the end of the day, the advisory board would accomplish the exact same thing as the police department hoped to accomplish through their transparency, and that is building up community trust, respect, and building that relationship. And so it is important for the community to understand that over 80% of the time, the conclusion of the advisory board is in agreement with the conclu conclusion of the investigative report of the police department. And I will also add from that is like, our goal is to have the best officers on the street. Just like they may come out 80% and say, hey, um, this matches up, this was a good um, investigation. We wanna also find that bad apple. So even if the board comes and say, hey, something is wrong. I, I, I think there's a pattern here. There's something going on. We should be able to trust that board in the same way that they will say, we think that this um, investigation was fair and the same way we think we got a bad apple. And those bad apples is what make the whole police department or a large mass of police department look really bad. And it's causing the distrust. So I think that that is perfect, um, a perfect way of, you know, discussing, like, what is the, the athens Clark County Police Department? Um, and thank you, Deputy Chief Daniel, for, for being here. Um, how does the, you know, I know that you, you I'm not asking you to, to speak any for any more than you can, but um, you've seen the task force recommendations, and can you just give us an idea of, of your thoughts on the task force recommendations, pluses and minuses, um, any, any of your thoughts. Sure, so thank you all for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you for in seeing the event. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you know, what you heard already tonight from uh, Mocha and Shane are a lot of things that I think we can agree on. And the first thing I want to emphasize is that um, 
though we may have some disagreements about small things, and, and like Mocha said, there were some uh, tough times during these meetings. I didn't participate in all of them, but I got to watch you know, most of them. There's a lot of things we can agree upon uh, when it comes to the oversight process, what it looks like and what it's designed to be, what its purpose is. Um, and, you know, to speak uh, for Chief Sproul just, just for a moment, he's been very consistent, you know, from the beginning that um, he believes in police oversight. He comes from a jurisdiction for the majority of his career where police oversight was part of their process. And so he's comfortable with it. Uh, he's in favor of it. Um, when it's fair and when it's impartial and when it's not geared in a way that could become adversarial. Uh, and so that we can all agree upon. We want to build positive relationships that there is opportunity there for the, uh, you know, for a police oversight function to help bridge some gaps. You know, certainly we don't always communicate the best, uh, you know, in, in a lot of walks of life, including the police department. And we want to get information out there, but sometimes it's hard to overcome the perceptions you heard Shane mention. Uh, and, and so in those, in those cases, it's good to have those voices that can help bridge that gap. And so there's a lot that we can absolutely agree upon when it comes to building positive relationships, uh, finding positive opportunities to improve uh, how we police within the community, uh, for seeking uh, new ways to do business, if, if you want to say that. Um, but the underlying concerns, I think, were raised from our perspective, from the police department, and, and as expressed by Chief Spruill, this, there were a few little things where, from the beginning, uh, some adversarial undertones kind of took hold pretty quickly, and um, you know, to a point where early on in the process, when uh, you know the chief spoke up in opposition of a few things, was asked not to return to the next meeting, and that kind of created a uh, you know an initial rift, and that caused some issues. I think we worked through a lot of that, uh, but that kind of set some tone to begin with, with, with some of the adversarial nature um, that was developing. And that's not consistent across the entire group, uh, but um, certainly that, that was felt from uh, Chief Spruill, felt from the police department. Um, with that and some of the recommendations, uh, I think that uh, some of them have a few potential fatal flaws that need to be examined a little further. Uh, in that they may uh, further some adversarial relationship between the board and the police department. And that's not what we want. We want to build positive relationships. Uh, and so those, some of the potential holes for some adversarial uh, relationships to develop is what we want to work on and iron out. Um, and some of that had to do with stepping into budgetary and defunding type issues um, with stepping into personnel matters and discipline and you know there, there's a structure in place through the government that does provide outlet for uh, how we manage personnel how we respond in cases of discipline um, and, and some of the recommendations might not fall quite in line with that and, and we think that some of that should still be worked on and, and cleaned up before anything is finalized um, you know last year we fielded uh, 48 complaints last year. And I know, Moki, you mentioned there may be others out there. And, and we've worked with Moka on some specific ones in the past year where, where people have raised complaints to you and we've brought you in and, uh, and, and shown you kind of the inside and behind the scenes of what we've seen and what we've done and, and what information developed from the complaint. Uh, and so, you know, we're already doing some of the things that you're talking about and the, the, the recommendations are, are uh, saying that we need to be doing. Some of that's already in existence and we can definitely uh, continue with that. Uh, but of those 48 complaints last year, 33% of that, 15 of them, I believe, were internal complaints. And so, you know, we do believe we're doing a lot of good work. Um, and if we can focus on some of that and, and be able to push that information out, as well as, uh, you know, identify those, those certain bad apples, as you call them, or circumstances where we need to improve or fix something, we're all on board for talking about it and finding positive ways to work toward that. Um, and so I think it's just a few minor things that, uh, that we think could be clarified and, and worked out within the recommendations. Um, but overall, you know, Chief Spruill said from the, the beginning, and our department uh, has the same sentiment. We support the idea of oversight when it's done in a positive way, in a way that builds relationships and, and that bridges those gaps. Oh, 
I think that is so, so awesome. Um, okay, you said that of the 48 complaints, 33 were internal? 33%. 33%, so okay. One third of the complaints came from uh, within the department. And what that means is that you had an officer or a supervisor reporting on the actions of another officer. And so, you know, from the beginning, we, we train our officers, we teach our officers, and policy expects that, uh, you know, they um, report up the chain of command when they believe that there's a policy violation that's occurred, and we hold our officers accountable to that. And, and you know, the evidence indicates that our officers are adhering to that. Um, the other thing I do want to mention is, you know, when, when it comes to uh, building relationships, one of the philosophies our police department's grounded on is procedural justice. And from the moment an officer walks in our doors, they're learning about procedural justice. It's built into our value system. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, you should look it up. Uh, one of the uh, leading scholars on it is a man named Tom Tyler, and you look up some of his research and the work he's done. But what procedural justice ultimately comes down to is it's understanding that the manner in which somebody's treated is more critical necessarily than the outcome. So it's the manner that the traffic stops conducted that's more critical to maintaining good relationships and establishing police legitimacy and trust than whether or not the person gets a warning or a ticket. Uh, it's how they're treated during the process. Uh, and we teach that from the beginning. And so, you know, like I said, built into our, our uh, value system and our training from the get-go is the idea of building positive relationships and understanding how to treat and interact with people, and that's what we expect. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Deputy Chief. So, Wait, before you go, sure, of course. I have to, I just, I have to clarify a couple of things because I hear things and I don't want it to keep circulating. When Mayor Gertz created this task force, there's no civilian oversight that can take away funds from the police department. That was a myth, and that myth continues to circulate. Conversations have came up to where um, during our call, during our meetings, where different members have made certain recommendations. But if you look in the final recommendations, there is nothing in there that permits, allow this entity to take away or redistribute or do anything with police funding or budgeting. This needs to stop. This is not a political game. People's lives are at risk. This is not about defunding, funding, taking away black lives, blue lives. This is about a community that needs to be fixed. We do not, there's people out here that do not trust the police. And we want this entity here so that we can improve community relations and policing. We cannot do anything with the budgeting. This entity, we cannot issue out discipline we can make recommendations to policies and rules that are already there based on um, the investigations and the monitor being able to be a part or right alongside or be able to ask questions for transparency and accountability. They can make recommendations, just like the officer said. They already have a procedure for discipline. Recommendation and being able to Cast down discipline is two different things. So let's stop playing games. The next thing is, since um, our organization does get complaints, and we do have some officers that respond, and and but it's not. It hasn't been the best or easiest process, and it could be better, and it was better, but it's not as the relationship is not like how it was a few years ago, and I'm just going to put it out there. So I just wanted to say those things because I just want to keep accuracy. Yeah, I think that a lot of times when we hear things like defund the police that, you know, it, it gets people sidetracked, I think, right? Like, right? That's not what this is, has nothing to do. There's no ability of the uh, auditor, monitor, or of the board to be able to impact any of that. And I think one of the things that I learned from watching the uh, government oversight, government operations committee uh, meeting from, from February 24th um, was that 
the actual process and the procedures that are in the Athens-Clarke County Police Department remain. Like, uh, if there is a complaint that's made, the complaint is handled by the Athens-Clarke County Police Department, the Internal Affairs Division, if I'm correct, right? So everything is done, the entire investigation is done by the Internal Affairs Department, uh, and then in, in the case that you are, in the model that you all are recommending, the monitor would just review the investigation after the investigation has been complete. Right. So there's no ability, uh, there's no funding issues at all that come into that. And so um, I think that one of the, the uh, concerns that you had, uh, Commissioner Denson, uh, during the <clears throat> last op op government operations committee meeting was, uh, well, one of how the auditor monitor would be placed uh, in terms of the organization chart. Uh, and then you also had some questions and concerns about um, general counsel and you referred to uh, the issues that the athens Clark County Board of Elections had had with trying to go for outside counsel. So if possible, sir, I, if you could talk about um, the task force recommendations uh, and <clears throat> what, uh, it, what your thoughts are about what it's going to take to move those recommendations forward to the commissioners on the full board. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, thanks for giving me the chance to talk about this. So, uh, the recommendations, which you know, kind of went over a bit, is that there be two main components. Auditor monitor, which would be, like you said, working like every day, a little bit more engaged um, with the police department, kind of going back and forth. And then this over this committee that the auditor monitor would engage with and kind of be able to, the auditor monitor would get kind of that connection back and forth. Um, and I thought, I, honestly, like I thought it was pretty good recommendations. I watched these meetings, um, very impressed by Shane and Mocha's uh, ability to facilitate what was at times definitely difficult conversations. And I'll tell you this, folks, I mean, watching those meetings, if some of these conversations during these things weren't difficult, then we weren't doing our job, right? I mean, our entire conversation about policing right now in our, 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 our nation, it's a difficult conversation. If we're really having a genuine conversation, it's going to be hard. And there's going to be some people who are going to get a little upset, and we're going to have to work through that. We're going to have to put our egos at the door and, and really put our community first. And um, so when the recommendations came forward, um, like I said, I watched these meetings go as they as it came, so I got to see how it kind of evolved, how people's, uh, how, how y'all's thought process got us there. And uh, for the most part, I'm I mean, I'll say right now, I still, I'm ready to go. I, I think these are pretty good. There's some, there's some little things that we need to fix. The legal counsel, I think, is one of those things. We got definitely got very messy with the board of elections, mm -hmm. um, and there's some issues there with that. Um, I think we can work through that one. Uh, all this pretty small. My concerns, uh, again, the um, requirements for members. It could get some of them are very, very specific, and would honestly be difficult for us to appoint. Um, and I, I would fear that we'd have a lot of vacancies, not be able to have forums actually have these things work. But for the most part, I think it makes a lot of sense. And uh, Jacqueline, you kind of put it very well. This committee will be working parallel to all the structures we already have. Mm -hmm. Parallel to. And I think it simply gives that extra um, perspective that people are going to have a little bit, um, be able to buy into a little more. Um, and this is not, and also, this is something that we do all the time. Uh, last week, we disappointed uh, Stormwater Utility Citizen Committee. We do this all the time. That's overseeing the stormwater utility, how it operates, making recommendations back to the commission on how this thing should work, so that we can make sure that we have the best system in place, stormwater system, to serve the community. This is no different. This is going to make, I believe, our police department better. It's going to be able to build trust with the police department. I And I think, and I hope, um, I think that what this really comes down to is it's trust on both sides. We need the police department to trust that the people of Athens know what they're doing and aren't going to go on some kind of partisan witch hunt. They're going to do their take this work seriously, and they're going to do it well. And then we need the same thing, those people to be able to build up trust with the police department. This is going to, to me, this is a win-win no matter how we go. And do some of the recommendations need to be tweaked here and there? Sure. But for the most part, this is ready to go. Um, I honestly... And I am honestly ready to vote it out of committee. Um, unfortunately, I don't have uh, 
the authority to get that started right away. Um, and we're still working on it. But we are getting closer. I agree the conversations over the last couple of meetings have gotten closer, uh, including the, the chief's input. And so um, I think the recommendations have got us 90% of the way there. And um, I'm ready to take that last 10% step. So. That is fantastic. When is the next uh, Thursday, government Thursday. operations committee meeting? Next week, Thursday. Well, it's supposed to be this Thursday. And actually, over the weekend, unfortunately, um, I got communication that it's been canceled. Uh, so we are now looking at August, which I, I will and say right now I'm frustrated because the committee already only meets once a month for an hour. So even if we met every single month, that's only 12 hours of committee work per year that we get to do. Um, and we normally don't meet Ju July or December. That's down to 10 hours. So um, I, I, I would like to see the committee put in that lecture work. Hopefully, instead of just canceling the meeting, we can have two meetings next month um, so that we can go ahead and get this moving. I appreciate that very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Jensen. Um, one of the key concerns that you had was the general counsel issue uh, with the auditor monitor hybrid model. Uh, and our wonderful panelist, Mr. Samuel Lee Ree here from uh, Atlanta, uh, has is an attorney, uh, and that could be fixed if you ma made sure that that auditor monitor position was filled by an attorney, right? Mm -hmm. So that was that was one of the recommendations that, that Mr. Reed had. Does that make sense? Making sure have, that the, the actual monitor is yes, and, an and attorney. I, I would have no problem with that. To me, the recommendation was more saying that if there was legal issues that arose and that representation was needed in court for some issue, right. that they wouldn't use county attorneys and that they instead would bring on their own yeah. counsel. Ah, and yeah. that to me, that was the, 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 the concern, was the bit that. Right. Um, concern. Yeah. Well, okay. the, the commissioner's concerned that we had recommended, because we're trying to make it as independent so that people can trust it on both sides. So if there's this issue, legal issue that occurred like the boards of election, we wanted the, the monitor to be able to have that option of getting an outside attorney to, to, to eliminate all conflict of interest. But Tim made some good points when we met, so um, we'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> and, also, and also, hopefully, hopefully it wouldn't be happening that often. I don't think Right. Uh, anyways, and um, I do feel that uh, the attorney's office has the capacity to um, to walk through those things. And also, it does happen sometimes where we do have conflicts, and the county will sometimes go ahead and uh, go ahead and get the outside canceled. That does happen. Um, the, the the issue was just simply putting it. What happened to the board of elections that happened without even telling us? We the taxpayers and getting on the hook for actually paying for attorneys that we never even knew that we hired and stuff. So there are a lot of problems with that, and we just don't want to see a repeat of that. Sure. Absolutely. And thank you for clarifying that, sir. Appreciate it. So, Mr. Reed, yes. you are my superstar. I just think that you're so amazing and fantastic. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, everybody else. But you really have done a lot, uh, both in Minneapolis before you came to Atlanta and since you've been in Atlanta. Um, and so can you really uh, just explain for folks what the past six years, seven years here in Atlanta has been eight for you? Years in Atlanta. Eight, eight yeah. years, forgive me. Um, can you explain, you know, what the Atlanta Citizen Review Board looks like and how it's structured? And uh, yeah, yes, please. Uh, the Atlanta Citizen Review Board was actually created out of the death of a 19 year old um, African American woman uh, during an illegal no knock warrant break in 2006. The, the city had two prior boards to that incident that were strictly volunteer boards. And um, they weren't meeting regularly and they weren't able to uh, meet the needs of the citizens. So in 2006, after the death of Ms. Gallen Johnson, uh, they created this independent investigative model um, to where the board would have city staff and a board, one to do the day-to-day -day operations conduct independent investigations and went to the board to make the decisions on the complaints and hired the executive director. Um, as I mentioned before, they haven't happened the two previous models. Uh, those models, they didn't conduct any investigations. The police department conducted investigations and the board sometimes met, sometimes didn't, 
it was just, just uh, it was a mess <laughs> for them at that time. Um, so fast forward, um, it was originally organized with 13 members, no, with 11 members and uh, $250,000. Since from 2008 to now, we've grown to 12 city staff, 15 board members, and our budget now is $1.4 million. Um, as an investigative model, citizens can file independently with us, and we conduct the investigations independently of the police department. The police department has to provide all the information. Um, they have to provide all the body one cameras, dash cam videos, <clears throat> any records, any um, provide officers must show up for their interviews. Um, we have access to training. So all of those things go into the investigation. Once the investigation is completed, then it's go to review and go to send it to the board who will make a disciplinary recommendation. The recommendation will go to the police chief. The police chief makes the ultimate decision whether it's going to be disciplined or not. So that's that's the, the process in a nutshell. We have other things that are involved in it, like mediation, for lower level type of complaints from the citizens' officers, misunderstanding or feelings type of thing. Get together, try to see if they can talk to resolve the complaint. If they can't resolve the complaint, then it goes on to an investigation. Another critical point of ours is outreach. Um, community engagement because even after you create oversight, you have to keep the citizens involved in it and engaged in it because with all the great transparency that you're providing, citizens need to see it and understand it so that they can continue to have this communication with the police department, have this communication with the, uh, with the elected officials. And that's how you get to that trust because you you're giving them information, they're giving you information. You, you have those trust back and forth and being accessible. Um, so that's really it in a nutshell. Um, the model that I came from in Minneapolis was the same way. Uh, it was an independent investigative model. And generally, you see independent investigative models in areas where um, there's been just... Uh, the, the, mind, the thing that's coming to my mind is horrific, but, but there's been really, really excessive type of force in the hill that is, that is galvanized community, community and said nothing's enough. And usually that has followed some type of review, some type of model that does not have independent investigations. You know, civilian so oversight grows over time. You know, it's like, I was listening to everything that you all had talked about. It's like, you start with an auditor model. If things don't improve, if the community doesn't, that trust is not established like you want it, things get worse, the changes need to happen. You know, you need to think about a, a more uh, robust type of model. Investigative models are more expensive. Um, you need to think about the type of powers that the agency is, would have. 2008, um, when the Land and Citizen Review Board was, was formed, 2007-2008 opens the door, um, it didn't have all the powers that it has now. We've changed the ordinance three times since then. Um, the, ordinance, it, the agency was added to the charter last year. 2010, it was... Um, it received subpoena power. Um, we now can take it use of force complaints that involve serious bodily injury or death without a signed complaint. Um, we can take anonymous complaints. I mean, it's a array of things that we built up over time as things changed and um, the community expressed concerns that were not being met. We had to adjust the model. So I do want to say this though. One, I'm glad that you have, you guys have this nice turnout. Two, you know, it's the difficult conversations that you have to have, as someone was saying earlier, in order to move forward. And the last thing is, 
you know, civilian oversight is truly about compromise, collaboration, and what is best for the community. Not for individuals, not for the department, not for the agency, but what is best for the citizens. I tell my people, my, my, my staff all the time, we exist for those that have nowhere else to go. They have nowhere else to go. They don't have a city council person they can go to. They don't have a lawyer friend. Nobody's paying attention to them. They may be a homeless person, but they still expect to have respect, and they still deserve to be recognized for the humanity. And that's what we do. That's what we provide, building that trust. So I think I answered your question. You that. did. You did. did. Well, you answered it well. So at this time, we'd like to invite you all to ask questions. I know that I have many, but um, it's not my turn. So um, at this time, yes, sir, in the red. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Um, first of all, I have two questions. First of all, where can we find the recommendations? You know, I've been kind of asleep on the board. That where, is. Where are the recommendations? Um, they have it up on the <clears throat> athens Clark County government website they have um, links to all the, rec the recommendations links to the YouTube videos that you can go back and watch them and I can send it to you I can send you the recommendations kind of yeah. do you have an email address sir yes sir. okay I'll get your email address and we will make sure that you get this. yeah before you leave if you want us to send it to you directly and you care to really go through it then you know put your name down on email and the, I guess a, a real overarching question is, who will the monitor report to? Who, who, who pays the monitor? Who is the monitor obligated to? Great question. Okay. <laughs> um, we wanted it to be independent, so the auditor or the monitor is supposed to report to the mayor and commission um, so that um, the, report, the review board is there. Um, we're not blocking out the city manager. We just want it to be as independent as possible. So um, the government has to fund the uh, this office. So uh, we feel that they should respond to the mayor. Kind of like a charter office. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question on the budgetary aspects of the whole entire project. And I'm hoping I can get some information on that. Such as the committee itself, I understand, is going to be paid. Correct? Is that correct or incorrect? Um, I have like several A, B, and C questions on this. We recommended for the committee to have a stipend, and it's not uncommon. There's other committees within Athens Clark County. Do you, know what that is, is. do you know what the stipend is, and do you have a budgetary outline of this project in general so that, this, that the town can review it? We will, but we do not yet. Because when will that be available? Uh, once we actually have a real recommendation. The recommendation hasn't even been finished from OPS. But we are, How we much do. time between approval and recommendation do you give the town to review the budgetary aspects of the project? Uh, there will be at least a month with multiple public comment periods available. Uh, it would be presented at a work session, and then usually a week later it would be presented at an agenda setting session uh, that can have public comment also, and then usually two to three weeks after that it would actually be at a voting session in which people would also again have okay. public comment. And then C and D is... Um, some aspects that were recommended in the proposal, I thought, were not only all, also funded travel by the committee if they needed to go somewhere to view something. It also included um, budgetary means for outside counsel, which you've talked about. And it also um, gave them authority to hire additional personnel within that department or committee. So who's going to be in charge on increasing this budget over time? Who's going to be managing that aspect of the budget? And question D of that is, um, where where is the money coming from? Out of what aspect of the Athens Clark County budget is this coming from? These are great questions. Thank you, ma'am. I mean, I can I can basically answer uh, what I would imagine things are going in that direction because again, we don't have an actual recommendation yet. But only only the mayor commission can actually do any kind of budgeting, as Luke pointed out before. No no committee has its has its own control over its own budget, increases its own budget. Uh, travel expenses, that is common. We have a board, uh, such as the Board of Elections or Planning Commission, that needs to have trainings. Uh, that is common for every single county in Georgia. All 109 counties do that. That you would pay for travel or trainings. Um, but again, that would all have to be still approved by the Mayor and Commission. Who, who's spearheading 
the budgetary aspects of this committee and project within the city. Who's spearheading all the money, budget, budgetary, budgetarily wise? And is the money coming out of the general fund? I would imagine it would come out of the general fund, okay. uh, as, as do most things. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we have a finance department that would be presenting all of the budgetary aspects of that, but again, uh -huh. it has to be actually approved by the mayor commission. Right, but who's, 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 who's spearheading the aspects of adding up all the numbers? Who's on the, on the, on the, the Finance department presents uh -huh. budgetary. Uh, we, we tell them what our priorities, what we want to see done. Uh -huh. They put the numbers together because that's honestly not what I went to school for. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then we vote on that. Okay. I mean, okay. but again, on the only people that have numbers. authority is right. on the budget dark parts is the commission. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. I just wanted to um, ask questions in reference to the points Ms. Mofa made, in reference to the points that the deputy made. Okay. Um, you said that there was a myth that people thought that. Um, this was for or against defunding the police. But did that myth grow or came about in reference to maybe uh, any members or yourself or anybody that was involved in vocalizing to defund the police? That's one point. The other question is, um, what community demands for the police oversight? Uh, do you have any numbers on that and who's saying it? I'm saying it. In reference to picking the people for the task, right? The You, you mentioned that the government is picking the the task force, there's a process for them to take it. Um, if the government is not seen as representing the, an equal share of the community, how can we trust that community to pick, to pick the right task force for that group? If a lot of people do not trust the, the government right now because of where they stand, um, for example, the first question, because it's a myth, I don't, I no longer want to address. I, um, we never, so this, this has been circulating before, it was, or, this, this was circulating because of political things. It was circulating before people, this task force existed. But have you ever, or your organization ever vocalized defunding the police? Mm -hmm. I would just mm -hmm. like to address that myth back. She's trying to, no, 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 I'm just. I mean, but my me, organization, my particular organization, ma'am, no. And that's a myth, and I do not want to continue to, to respond to a myth. Um, the next thing is that the mayor and commission, they are supposed to reach out to organizations that's within this community. So, for example, the Chamber of Commerce was one of the people that wanted to have a seat at the table. If they are written into the recommendations as far as having a seat at the table, they get to pick someone or recommend someone. Um, How can we at this that it, for example, a lot of people don't trust the fact that they, they are lopsided as far as, and I hate to say it, but I'm they have to be brought up to the table. You know, the, I mean, the there, politics is lopsided right now in the government. So how could, Mr. Denson, could you address that? How can Notice you, out if you don't like us. We, I mean, majority of the, of the community, we work for a majority of the community choosing us. So we're all gonna be the majority. So it's true whether we might make a, a minority of people who aren't happy with our decisions who's on the board. That's that's for everything. That's the situation for everything. But our process is inclusive. Everybody can apply for one of these. We would then interview them like we do everything else. And, and who then does the, the interviewing? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm with you, with you, but I want to be. I just want to be respectful. Okay. Yeah, I just want to be respectful. And I'm sorry. I'm okay. not attacking anybody. There's just questions that do arise that I think should be cleared up. You know, that would be better for you to address those questions, Mr. Denson, as well as Ms. Lopez. Absolutely. Those are that arise. I, I, and thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, and I appreciate you answering that as well. Okay, sir, you had a question. Couple just quick comments, sure. and then uh, a couple very quick questions. The defund the police movement myth that was uh, cast on uh, Mocha and AADM. Yeah, uh, that would be the Republican State Leadership Committee. It was a nationwide campaign, and uh, uh, Representative Houston Gaines perpetuated that myth here in Athens, uh, Clark County, and beyond. So that would be Carl Rove and the Republican State Leadership Committee. And our organization, as far as AADM, has never been, I don't know why this is even coming up as far as AADM ever saying anything of that sort, because we have not. We have never made a statement. We have never organized a rally that said, a world without cops, that was not our organization. Okay? Everything that our organization have done for the past several years, just like how 
Sergeant Daniels is sitting here. We have invited them to the table. Deputy, Deputy I'm Chief. sorry. Deputy yes. Chief have responded to our emails, and we continue, even though we might not see eye to eye. I've sat with Chief School. I've dealt with Chief Freeman. I've dealt with a lot of police officers, and that's one thing I will say is even though we might not see eye to eye on every issue, we have been able to come to some table and have some type of conversation and walk away, whether respectfully disagreeing and showing how we can work together on the things that we do agree upon. And you personally have never defunded the police? You have never voiced that? So, she, she ma'am, I answered that already. Already. Answered that already. See, that's and what we, I'm saying. We want, it's we want this ongoing good energy thing. to continue <laughs> here. And she has already <laughs> answered that they question. So, answer out thank you very much. Excuse me, question. Joey. They took her answer so, out of context. It was straight from the report. So Joey Carter, can you ask your question, please? So, I'm asking well, a question. I can't speak for her. Ask another question. Move on. But I'm going to ask my What I have my question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Joey. Just one quick question to Commissioner Denson. Who's the chair of the Government Operations Committee? Uh, Commissioner Mike Andrews. Okay, got it. And then to the uh, Deputy Chief, uh, I've had uh, dozens and dozens of conversations with uh, police officers. I uh, believe uh, peace officers, police officers are very important to our community. Uh, a definite entrenched a group of Athens Clark County police officer leaders believe the following statement all law enforcement is punitive. Isn't that one? Do you acknowledge that some of the leadership believes that, number one, or something close to that? And isn't that one of our biggest problems in the community as evidence? for instance, by the police protests last year, where 80% of the police officers probably would have handled it differently, but in fact, okay. a small group yeah. of officers. Okay. That's, yeah. that's my, uh, I guess okay. that's my only yeah. we'll question. Have to, we'll have to leave my only question. I'll give you an opportunity. Deputy Chief. I'm sure. So, <clears throat> I can't speak to whoever you're referring to necessarily, um, but again, you know, what I would like to reemphasize, and Mo could just kind of hit this point the nail on the head, is that there's a lot of places we can work together, and there's a lot of ways to build positive relationships. There's a couple of small issues that I think, you know, we've raised, and, and we expect the Government Operations Committee to listen to all sides and make their determination. And that's really what the process is. That's the process that was set in place uh, from the beginning. Um, and so, though I can't speak to the, any individual beliefs or perspectives of whoever you might be referring to, um, you know, there's a couple of minor things that we think should be worked out. And I do want to point out one thing, and, and, and though it's not a final decision authority, but one of the clear authorities bulleted under the recommendations is uh, for the, the, this commission is to make budgetary recommendations pertaining to ACCPD. And so, though it may not be a final decision, one of our concerns is that does have an impact and it may potentially impact budgeting, and that can be problematic if the board is not fair and impartial, uh, and, and that's you know, what we're asking for, is a fair and impartial board that we can work with and not against. Uh, and so I did want to point that out also. Yes, sir. I think that's Joey, and then we're gonna have one more after that. Um, Joey. Can we walk through the mechanics of how the committee operates beginning with a complaint and ending with a decision. There needs to be more discussion about those mechanics that I think uh, would be helpful for more people to understand. In two minutes. In two minutes. Yeah, it's, 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 I don't think we can do it in two minutes. Yeah, yeah. So, I, mean, I, mean, I can we'll summarize we'll do, the complaint um, and discipline process yeah. generally if you want. That's it. Yeah, uh, because it is, sure. it is all with the police mm -hmm. department. And again, the police chief has the ultimate decision on all disciplinary, all, on all recommendations. Yeah. And that's what we would ask for. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the, the way it works is uh, a complaint can be generated from any location, internal or external. We accept anonymous complaints. We accept uh, written complaints, email complaints. Uh, but we'll take any complaint, and then uh, the basic facts and information are weighed out. Complaints go through our Office of Professional Standards which reports directly to the chief of police. And then from there, there's a decision that would have to be made as to 
what's the nature of our complaint? Is it something as extreme as excessive force, or is it a minor rudeness complaint? And then that would determine our initial response. So if it's an extreme complaint, it might be handled independently of the chain of command or the leadership of that officer by our Office of Professional Standards. It's fully investigated, a report's written, and then that's ultimately sent up to the Chief of Police with a recommendation on whether or not a policy was violated or more than one policy or no policies were violated. Uh, and then the Chief of Police would make a recommendation on discipline if it's warranted in that case. If it's a minor issue, then generally it's going to be handled by our supervision, uh, and the supervisor would make a recommendation as to what the issue is, whether or not it was a minor policy violation, and what the uh, consequences should be. That's forwarded up, also reviewed through our Office of Professional Standards and checked off on. And then all that's written up and documented in a report, and then ultimately 10 days after the case is closed, it's subject to open record anyway. Uh, and so they're, all, they're already subject to public inspection. Um, the idea with the, the um, auditor, monitor, auditor monitor model would be that the auditor and monitor would be able to be a person directly assigned to reviewing, because obviously a lot of people may not have time to get on uh, our website and see all the policies that we put on our website, or to uh, file an open records request and get uh, you know, a complete investigative file. And so that's the idea that they would be able to review it make a, a, some determination from their perspective about the outcome of it, uh, and, then tr and then produce that publicly and hopefully generate some additional uh, trust with the community. Like Shane said, 80% of the time, uh, these models typically find uh, the same thing as the police department did. That's it in a nutshell. I, I hope that was clear. Sure. Yeah. Uh, clear <laughs> and on, on time. It was outstanding. Yes, ma'am, you will be our last uh, question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the auditor monitor um, position. And, and first, I want to thank all of you up there um, and Shane and Muga. Um, I listened to a lot of the, the task force uh, meetings that were online. And I actually would suggest that if anyone wanted to hear what was really going on in that committee from the start, is just line those up on YouTube, you know, and start washing the dishes and whatever else because. There's a lot you can learn from the reality of listening to all of those things. I also want to thank the um, deputy chief for being here. I mean, I listened to them Absolutely. as well in the meetings, and there might have been some contentious parts, but there were a lot of really good discussions in there. Um, so I want to thank you as well. Um, my question had to do with the auditor-monitor um, position and whether or not we are a community that's large enough for that to be a full-time job versus a half-time job? Because I've been listening to the Government Operations Committee, and I'm just curious what the reflections are on that position and where that's going. I mean, with all the recommendations of um, engaging with the community and doing certain work, yes, it would be a full-time job. And I would, if we, if you could just See, I want everybody to know there were several different models, and we did uh -huh. not pick the investigative model because we felt like the size of Athens, and, and like he said, it wasn't a thing to where there was the same type of issues that were happening other places. So we picked a model that would not cost Athens a lot of money, and they're not going in and investigating. We still, the police still do their job, and we build this relationship, okay? So we could have said, oh, we want an investigative model subpoena if we had... It's not, it's not that type of city right now. So could you just explain why someone would need a, a, yeah. a full-time job? Yeah. Um, any type of oversight you have, no matter what the model is, you need to have at least, at least one full-time person for the day-to-day -day operation. Police department, all police departments operate 24-7, right? Changes the policies occur as needed, and depending on the powers that the that the agency or the review authority is going to have, it's definitely going to dictate someone being on top of it every day. I mentioned earlier about Atlanta; they tried to purely volunteer type of review models, never worked. It didn't work. It it actually frustrated the community even more. Because when an incident occurred, they said, well, where's the civilian review board? Oh, well, they haven't met. Oh, well, they behind on all of these cases. Um, they haven't looked at them. Because these are volunteers. They have other things that they need to do. The person who is operating or serving as that auditor 
is the one for the community to hold accountable, the one for the police department to hold accountable, and the one for the elected officials to hold accountable to ensure that everything that needs to happen with that operation, whatever the powers are, is occurring. That's why you really want to have somebody doing that day-to-day -day stuff. This is not, I mean, if this was uh, watching the flowers grow or something like that, <laughs> yeah, we can have somebody part-time doing that. We're talking about real-life issues here that citizens, your citizens, want to make sure, would like to know that somebody is paying attention to. That's it. Thank you. So, um, Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. I've lived uh, 50 of my 68 young years here in Athens, and I was on the original Clark County Police Force. Judge Lawrence formed it, so did it a couple years, and I got into business. I'm now retired, but I recently, um, well, I had a patch that said to protect and serve, and that's what I, I, I tried to live up to that. And uh, I understood custody meant they're in my care now. Um, but I never had anybody that I arrested, and, and there's probably a thousand that said, you know, you got me. There was some level of resistance at every time, at every arrest, big or little. Recently, though, I was at a meeting with uh, Officer Robbie Cochran, you know Robbie, and uh, this blew my mind. I'm just doing it quick, and I'll shut up. Um, and Katie McFarland, who's with Advantage, and I didn't know this, but Athens Park County Police professional standards on advanced behavioral health crisis response training is exemplary and actually other agencies around the state and around the country are sending people here saying what are y'all doing how are you doing it and I really encourage everybody to reach out to uh, Robbie and also to uh, uh, Robbie, Co Cochran, Robbie Cochran and, uh, and, uh, and Katie Robbie and, and, and let them come in and they, they would be great here to explain listen this is what we do when we have a mental health situation Thank and you. how it escalates what our standards and what our procedures they have each of these officers here, or anybody at Clark County. Um, number one, I could be a police officer because I can't run a computer. But <laughs> the training they get is over 82 hours, and the excellence, I just felt, I said, wow. And so this, I always believe the biggest room in the house is room for improvement. I'm not naive, but I think there's a lot of real positive things going on, too, directionally. They're going to pay some real good dividends. Uh, I love Athens, Robbie. Right? Somewhere else. Yeah. And I will say, I will say, with Robbie, I was, yeah. I was there when I know when that department was first implemented, and it's because of conversations like these. You bet. So there is improvement that needs to be made. I remember when it was just Robbie by himself and did not have the staff to support that. Was a part of different processes to see that built up to where three, four years later, yeah. yes, it's it's definitely the, the, the doing success the stories job. they have, which will never be told. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the talk downs and the lives yeah. saved and the mitigation yeah. and hey let's get you, let's don't just put you in jail let's get you some help and and the fruit is coming out of that I don't know how we make that more public but it's really phenomenal I was and, very it's a, and it's a new department and that's the yeah. beautiful thing of having new entities to be able to address these issues yeah. Yeah. so um, we're going to we're going to have to close out I am so sorry um, the mall does close at um, seven o'clock, and um, <laughs> that's what it is. Like, the mall does close at, you know, it does close at seven o'clock. But listen, everybody, I really want to thank each and every one of you guys for being here today. Even if you have different perspective from myself and anyone on this panel, your voice does matter, just like my voice matter. And my experience and someone else's experience, you cannot discount somebody's experience just because you're not having it. You know, um, so just like the gentleman said, that mental health division did not exist a few years ago. And people were going to jail, not just because they were bad people, but they had there were some mental health issues. So when people think that we're so against the police department, I've seen different things happen and have been a part of that process, when I was a part of that board, when I was advocating for something to make them say, hey, well, maybe we need to look over here. But there's never a time that I would not sit at the table and have a conversation to see where we can find a mutual space for the betterment of this community. So that's all I have to say. Not answering anymore about no defunding, funding, this, don't ask me that anymore. I'm not responding to that. <laughs> Thank y'all for being here and have a wonderful day. Woo!